Well, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed When you are discouraged thinking all is lost Count your many blessings, name them one by one And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done Count your blessings, name them one by one blessings see what God has done count your blessings name them one by one count your many blessings see what God has done are you ever burdened with the load of care does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear count your many blessings every doubt will fly and you will be singing as the days go by count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what god has done count your blessings name them one by one count your many blessings see what god has done and when you look at others with their land Gold. Think that Christ has promised you His wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. God has done. And so amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Well, it's not in trying, but in trusting. It's not in running, but in resting. It's not
Jesus, we love you, Father. God, what a privilege you've given us to be able to come together with your children and lift our voices and sing of your goodness, of your grace, of your love. God, just the ability to express our love to you, Lord, is such a tremendous blessing. And God, now as we come, Lord, to the time where we take this word and begin to read it, Lord, we know we need more than the ability to read. We need more than intellect. We need more than the mind of a man, but we need you to come on the scene, Lord. 
We're depending on you. We've come to commune with you, Lord, to worship you, to bow before you, to surrender to your word. I pray, God, that you would come and take this vessel of clay and take it into your own hand, Lord, and use it for your purpose to break the word of life to your waiting children. God, may we feed from you today and receive the portion you have allotted for us. God, through it all, may you get glory. May your body be edified. Where we love you, Lord. Have preeminence among us, we pray. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And while we're standing, let's just read a scripture out of 1 Peter chapter 1. Also, uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure to say that we'll be having a baptism today at the end of service. Our brother Alan and sister Tammy Reisner desire to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a double baptism, a husband and wife together, and I think that's a tremendous thing. So I'm looking forward to that. Consider it a tremendous blessing just to be able to be part of that. Also, I want to uh, just thank everybody who helped with the meetings this last weekend. It was wonderful. I so appreciated the word. I appreciated the fellowship. I was really, really blessed by it. So I thank God for everybody who contributed and did their part. Brother Alistair is home safe. He let me know he got back home, so appreciate your prayers. Brother Daniel White and his family will be at True Word Tabernacle this morning. Brother Daniel's taking the morning service. Then they'll be heading to Detroit tonight, and they're flying out early in the morning. So remember them in prayer as they travel home. But they all had a wonderful time. They all commented on how kind you all were and how loving and how they felt at home. And uh, that did my heart a lot of good as well. So God bless you all, and thank you for that. Man, I was, I was greatly edified and fed by the word this past weekend, and it was a great encouragement to all of us, I believe. But uh, now let's, t- let's look into the word here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. First Peter 1 and 13. Submit yourselves to every ordin- ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be, no, I'm in the wrong spot. I'm in second. I'm sorry, First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. God bless you as you take your seats. Amen. So I was reading out of chapter 2, verse 13. I said chapter 1 over and over. And it's never as, as fun for me, as interesting as for when Brother Branham gets the wrong scripture because it's the word opening in a major way. Me, it's just a man who can't find the right chapter. But anyways, God is good to us. And I wanted to look at this scripture here as a, as a springboard to launch into the subject of holy unto the Lord. I want to take for a subject holy unto the Lord. And I want to look at some scriptures and talk about this. And one of the main reasons is God dropped this in my heart, this just title, Holy Unto the Lord. And in meditating on it, I realized that so often we have a wrong understanding of what it means to be holy. We have a wrong understanding of holiness. I find so many times within myself, and I don't know about you, but I can speak for myself, that sometimes I come up with a Nazarene idea of holiness, or I come with a, you know, a previous church age idea of holiness, and I haven't really caught the concept that God's bringing of what it means to be holy. It's not necessarily what I've always thought it to be. I'd like to go back and look at this in the Old Testament. If you can go with me to Leviticus. And we're going to go to quite a number of scriptures today. But if you could keep your Bibles handy, we'll go to Leviticus and begin looking at this subject. So Peter commends us to be holy, to be holy in all manner of conversation. Conversation is the way you live. It's not just talking to another person, but in the Bible, this word conversation means your lifestyle or the way you live. And we're to be holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Because God is holy, he's called us to be holy. And so when we look at this in comparison, we begin to think, because God is holy, I must be holy. Then, then somehow my, my idea of being holy or holiness is some level of perfection where there's never a fault in me anymore. 
that I never make a mistake, that I've come to sinless perfection, and when I get to this point where I'm never, I have no more fault, then I'll be holy. But that is not the Bible definition of what it means to be holy. And so I want to look into the scripture when God says be holy or call something holy, what is God talking about? Because I don't want to get an old Methodist idea or a Nazarene idea or a Pentecostal idea of holiness. And when we talk about holiness, sometimes our mind goes, amen, to long hair and long dresses and that old holiness Pentecostal that came in from the Nazarenes, amen. And that's not necessarily the definition of holiness. Amen, you, you could... You could, uh, you could be dressed perfectly modest and in every way your attire can be pleasing to what God desires for a woman or a man to dress and you can still not be holy. So it's not just when we say holiness, we got, I, I want to break myself away from the Pilgrim Holiness Church. I want to break myself away from the Nazarenes and from the Methodists and from the Pentecostal holiness and I want to know when God calls something holy, what does he mean by that? When he tells us to be holy, what does he mean by that? Because if not, we find ourselves going back into a works program where we must be holy by doing a lot of good things to be holy, and we can do a lot of good things and not be anyways in any way holy at all. We can act right, talk right, dress right, and not even be close to being holy. So what does it mean to be holy? Let's look at Leviticus chapter 20, verse 5. It says, then I will set my face against, against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards do go a whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. So there's a couple words here that I want to look at. The word sanctify yourselves, and I am the Lord that sanctify you, and be ye holy. And I want to look at what, what this means and what the Lord's referring to. So if we look at the word uh, sanctify, the word sanctify and the word holy in, this, in these uh, uh, last two uh, verses, verse 7 and verse 8, are very similar words. They're very close to one another with similar meanings. So the word, uh, the word sanctify means to consecrate, to sanctify, prepare, to dedicate, to be hallowed, to be holy, to be sanctified, or be separate. The word holy means something that's sacred, or holy, or a saint, or something that's set apart. And so we'll find, Brother Frank, if you could bring up the whiteboard, I think I'm gonna use that a little bit this morning. We find, I, I, I want to, um, I, I want us to have, I, I myself want to have an understanding of this, so I don't, if I slip back into that legalistic mode of being holy, then I'm gonna find myself really frustrated. And when I have to, when I have to be holy by keeping a code, then I'm gonna find myself always short of holiness and, and, and it becomes an unattainable goal. Uh, I've used the analogy before, the, it's the carrot on the stick, but somebody in my family told me that half the people probably don't have a clue what I'm talking about, especially young people, and I, I'm realizing that I still consider myself really young. But I did have a rotary dial phone when I was a kid and I lost half the crowd. <laughs> when we talk about the, the carrot on the stick, hey man, it's the old thing, if you have a donkey and you're sitting on your donkey and you can't get the donkey to move forward and, and you whip him in the back, he's not going, hey man, some clever kid found out one day, if I just take a stick and I tie a carrot on it and I hold it out in front of the donkey, the donkey walks towards the carrot. Get him to move, amen. That's great to get a donkey to move, amen? But, but eventually the donkey's gonna realize, I have never eaten that carrot. 
This is an unattainable goal. And sometimes we, we, the ideas that we have are unattainable goals. The concepts that come down by tradition through church ages. And, and these, were, these were people's best idea, best concept on, on teaching the word. But we've got the open book in this day that opened up the very nature of God to us. Amen. To understand God in a way that we're not constantly plodding along after an unattainable goal. Amen. And, and we're, not, we're not moving and being motivated by trying to gain to this thing that we're never going to gain on our own with our own efforts. It's an absolute impossibility. All we do is, is move, 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 but we never get there, amen? And I don't, want, I don't want to become tired in my service to God. I want to be joyful and vibrant and exuberant in my service to the Lord. I don't want the old tired feeling of I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to arrive. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never, never, never. And, and, and it's, it's this constant motivation to do better. And we do good for a couple of days and then we fail and we go right back to the starting point and got to start all over again. That is not how God leads his people. That is not God how God has instructed his people. Amen. So I, I, want, to, I want to understand these things in a different light. So I'm gonna write on this board here and I wanna look at a couple terms. First term is holy. Now in the Bible we look at English words and English words trying to be become a definition for what was written originally in Hebrew or in Greek or Aramaic or however it was, amen. So sometimes words are used interchangeably. Sometimes we'll see the same uh, English word like sanctify. It can be used three or four times, but underneath that word is two or three different Greek words that sanctify is trying to fulfill. Love is one, for instance. Love can mean a, 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 a familiar feeling love for a friend or agape love, which is perfect love, the love of God. Amen, and it's the same English word, but there's actually two concepts laying underneath of that. The same thing with the terms holy and, and sanctify and consecrate, amen. Sometimes you can use the same English word, but it's being used in place of two different Hebrew words, two different Greek words, amen, just trying to understand. But when you go and look back at what God's saying and what the prophet has taught us, we begin to understand what it is God wants from his people. What is it that God is looking for? What is it he's instructing? us in. So when we look at the word holy, we can, we can say that which is sacred or set apart. Now, I'm trying just to keep things simple. I mean, we could go into a word study and go for hours and talk about the nuances and I would be the only one having fun this morning. I'm trying not to make a simple subject complicated. I just want to keep a simple subject simple. So that's what I'm trying my best to do. I find sometimes that I can make things that should be simple complicated, and I'm not trying to do that. So to sanctify, to sanctify or be sanctified or sanctifying all of these versions of sanctify, if we could just look at it this way, it means to separate. To separate. To be separate. Or to consecrate. When, when some of these terms are used, we can talk about something that's holy. When we talk about something that's holy in the Bible, we're talking about something that is sacred. It's sacred in itself. It is a sacred thing. It is something that is set apart. It's designated differently. It's, it's, it's sacred. It's set apart. When we talk about sanctify, it can be the to separate, the act of separating the thing that will be holy. Or, or it can be to be separate. It, it, it could be both. It can mean either that which is being separated or that which is already separate. 
And that's what can be confusing about this. So is holiness the act of being separate or is holiness being separate, amen? And I would say it's both, amen? It's the act of being separate and it's, it's, it's also already separate. We'll get into this. You'll understand it better. Or it means to consecrate. So we consecrate and dedicate this. We have consecrated this sanctuary to the worship of God. We don't do other things in here. This is consecrated to the worship of God. This place is set apart, set aside. It is holy. The chairs aren't holy. The carpet isn't holy. The, the desk isn't holy. The air conditioning isn't holy. The drywall's not holy. The paint's not holy. In itself, it is not sacred in that it has sacred properties in itself. But when you say Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is sacred in itself, right? So when I say the Holy Ghost, when I say the Holy God, when I say the Holy One, it's holy in itself. It is holy. It is sacred. If its own property, it's sacred. But when I say this is now a holy sanctuary, this is set apart and consecrated and dedicated for the worship of God, it's holy by designation because it's been set apart for a holy purpose. All right, we're starting to understand. And the act of consecrating this place, putting doors up, putting seats in, keeping everybody out, setting guidelines, we don't do this in here, we don't do that, amen, that is the act of sanctifying or hallowing this place. So when we don't run, when we don't talk, when the deacons watch the doors, when we make sure that there's there's nothing going on in here that's inappropriate, we are sanctifying this place, keeping it holy. Does that make sense? All right, because all of these terms, we can throw out a lot of terms and then get confused, sanctified, to be sanctified, holy, holiness, but really the, the, there's, there's, there's a holy thing that is set apart, amen, and considered sacred and holy. There's also holy things that are sacred by their own properties. The holy God, the holy ghost, the holy word. It's sacred in itself. Some things are sacred because we set it apart to be used for sacred purposes. Then the act of setting that apart, the act of keeping it separated is sanctifying or sanctified. We've got that. All right. So let's, let's, let's do a little reading. All right. So we read in Leviticus chapter 20 that he says, sanctify yourselves. So let's look at this again. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Sanctify yourselves. That means separate yourselves. Sanctify yourselves is not necessarily clean yourself up and make yourself perfect, but sanctify yourself is separate yourself and designate yourself to God. That means a separation from the world. Amen. So, so whenever we obey the word of God, because God's word is holy, whenever we come in obedience to the word of God, amen, we are separating ourselves from something. Amen. If God gives an idea or a concept about something, whether it's the way we should conduct ourselves, the way we should dress, or who we should marry or who we should not marry, if we get into that and God designates in his word, amen, then when we make the choice to obey the word, we are now sanctifying ourselves, are setting ourselves apart from the wrong idea and aligning to the right idea, which is God's holy word, and we have sanctified ourselves. We haven't purified ourselves. We can't purify ourselves, but we consecrate ourselves and set ourselves aside to the word of God. We've, come, we've separated to the word, separated from the world. You say, well, we're either in the world or or we're separated from the world. I would say it this way. We are separating from the world, choice by choice, thought by thought, obedience by obedience, command by command. We are separating from the world and maintaining our separation by the choices that we make. Just like we keep this place consecrated and sanctified for the use, we keep it hallowed and holy for the purpose of worshiping God, we have to keep it sanctified. And so he says, sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, which means to be you sacred or set apart. So separate yourselves and be separate. 
For I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and do them. I, I am the Lord which sanctify you. So now do we sanctify ourselves, or does God sanctify us? The answer is amen. We are, we are to separate from the world's idea and take God's word, amen? We sanctify ourselves to obey his word, amen? But, but God is the one who sanctifies us because unless he separates us out, we'll never be separated. Unless he calls us, unless he designates us, we will never be a separated people. We can never be a holy people unless he sanctifies us. But he says, sanctify yourselves and be holy, how can I be holy if, my, if I have to be sinlessly perfect with no flaw in order to be holy? How can I be holy? No, I am separating myself and I am staying connected with God so I'm sanctifying myself and being holy because he sanctified me. Amen. Praise God. It is, it is very much has to do with positioning. If we can see that, I think it would help. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 35. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 35 and verse 3. Now, when I go through this, I'm going to be talking about... Uh, Legalism. I'm talking about old-fashioned holiness ideas and all that. And I don't want one person in here to get the wrong idea because when it comes to my personal conduct and what I believe, amen, I am very tight because I believe what God said God meant and I believe what the prophet taught is exactly what God wants for us. So the standard that we preach will never change, amen? But the, what I'm trying to point out is keeping a standard is not make you holy. Legalism can never make you holy. So just because I have preached against one thing doesn't mean I've changed my mind. My, I, in fact, the closer I get to God, the tighter that standard becomes for me, amen, because of what God's doing in my life. As I separate, and the more that I separate, the more I see what was there. So at some point, there's, the, the world has influence over us, and, and, and you, there's certain things we just don't see. That's why we have to be patient with new believers, amen, when we have to be patient with our teenagers sometimes, is because new believers just don't see. It takes separation sometimes to bring vision. And as we obey the word, then we see, amen? And then when we separate, we see. As Israel separated more and more, they begin to see the fallacy of Egypt. But early on, when they first went into a trial, they said, let's go back to Egypt. It was pretty good there. So as we separate more, it actually doesn't bring a laxness in our life or a lowering of the standard. For me personally, what it's done is given me a clear vision on why that's wrong. What's the spirit behind it? Why did the prophet teach it? And it makes me in my heart have a desire, amen, to, to stay consecrated and stay separated from the world. It in no way ever makes me want to say, well, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I mean, that's not really going to make you holy, so this doesn't matter. Everything matters. Everything matters. If we could understand that, everything matters to God. What we say, what we look at, what we hear, how we speak, how we dress, how we carry ourselves, the attitudes of our heart, everything matters. We'll never get to the place where it doesn't matter. It matters. What I want to do is not chase the wrong thing and try to obtain an unattainable goal. I want to find out what God meant by these things, and, and I want to follow after that. So 2 Chronicles 35 and 3. And said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, Put the holy ark in, uh, unto the Lord. Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, thy son David, king of Israel, did build. So I just want the first part of that phrase to catch something. And he said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy, which were holy unto the Lord. The Levites were holy unto the Lord. What makes the Levites holy unto the Lord was not that they were born holy. 
as far as sinless. And, and it's even not that the Levites lived with no flaw. Do you believe that the Levites, uh, different than the other 11 uh, tribes, that the other 11 tribes constantly had struggles, but the Levites didn't have any struggle? And the 11, they constantly made mistakes, but the Levites, because they were holy unto the Lord and told to be holy, they never failed, they never sinned, they never made a mistake, they never did anything wrong. That's foolish, amen? What made them holy is God separated them out from the 12 and said, you will be priest, amen? This is your job. Because they were separated by God, they were holy. That's what made them holy is their separation, not, their, not necessarily that they were born into a perfect family and had perfect conduct all of their lives. Amen. The Levites failed like every other tribe failed. The Levites had sin like every other tribe had sin. Even God would designate a high priest, and that high priest would be, be holiness unto God. He would be the most holy of the Levites, would be the high priest. What made him the most holy is because he was the only one chosen for that office, it did not make him sinlessly perfect, amen? And he did not have to come to sinless perfection to be the high priest. He was high priest because God chose, listen, Israel was holy because God chose Israel. They were set apart from all the other nations. That made them a holy nation. If you read the history, it, it, it was not because they were perfect. It was not because they never made a mistake. It was not because they got it all right and they completely understood everything God wanted. They failed and failed and failed and failed. What made them a holy nation is because God chose them. Amen. He chose Abraham. He chose Abraham's seed. He called them out. Amen. And, call, and, and they were a holy nation because they were separated unto God. Then out of that nation, he chose one family, Levi, amen, to bear the ark, to take care of the vessels, to be the priest. And out of that one family, that one tribe, he chose one family, one man, Aaron and his descendants to be the high priest. So was Aaron the most well-behaved of the Levites and the Levites the most well-behaved of the Israelites and the Israelites the most well-behaved of the world? The answer is no. God chose them and separated them out. Then he chose Levi and separated him out. Then he chose Aaron and separated him out. Amen. And Aaron was the high priest. And this becomes evident because on the day of atonement, Aaron, as the most holy priest unto God, had to put on all the holy garments and go before God and offer an atonement for the nation. He was to, he was to give a sacrifice that would cover for the sins of all the people. And he's the only one that can do it. But before he offered that sacrifice, he had to offer a sacrifice for himself, for his sins and the sins of his family. So was the high priest perfect? Absolutely not, or else he would never have to precede the, the uh, 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 sacrifice of atonement for the nation without making a sacrifice for himself. It proves that he was not perfect. He had to make a sacrifice for himself and for his household. Then when he was accepted by making this sacrifice, then he could make a sacrifice for the whole nation. So what made him holy is God chose him and set him apart. That's what made him holy. Without that, he had no hope. If it wasn't for that, he had no hope. But God knew. Let's go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 1. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness in the land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. 
Israel was holiness unto the Lord. How did Israel become holiness unto the Lord in the wilderness? He goes, I remember back when I first brought you out of Egypt, when you followed after me in the wilderness. And that day, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. What did it mean for Israel to be holiness unto the Lord? What it meant was Israel was separated to the Lord. That word holiness that's there is kodesh, and it means apartness, holiness, sacredness, separateness. So what made them holiness unto the Lord is that they were separated from Egypt. They were separated from all nations. They were drawn into the wilderness, and they were dedicated, consecrated, separated unto God. They were holiness unto the Lord. And it, I mean, you've read the wilderness journey, right? You've read the murmurings and the complaints and the backslidings and the turning back and the disobedience. You've read all of that. Amen. So when he says Israel was holiness unto the Lord, it wasn't Israel pious, dressed right, looking nice, saying amen just right, doing everything perfect. It was not that way because Israel was murmuring about no bread, murmuring about no water, blaming Moses and blaming God for no meat and saying that we should go back to Egypt. And when God gave them bread, he said, only take this much. Don't take more. They took more and it turned into, they disobeyed constantly. They murmured, they complained, but Israel was holiness unto the Lord because God selected them out and called them to himself and they were a separated people unto him. Praise God. God is good. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 30. We'll read in Exodus for a little bit. Exodus chapter 30, verse 34. This is the, the instructions that God has given Moses in making the uh, special incense that will be burned on the altar of incense. So in chapter 30, verse 34, these are the instructions he gives. He says, and the Lord said to Moses, take unto these sweet spices, Stacked and Annika and I don't know what all they are. Galbonum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a light weight. And you shall, and thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy." And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. It shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. So he calls this perfume holy. Holy, it is, it is holy for the Lord. Amen. And this is such an interesting uh, uh, statement. He says, make it. He gives, the, he gives the recipe. Amen. Add so much of this and so much of this. Beat it small. Burn it there. You shall not make like this to burn in your homes. This is holy of the Lord, which means you can't you can't use it for any other purpose. You can't use it in any other way. Amen. It didn't make the spices come down from heaven. Amen. It did not make them sacred or holy in themselves. They didn't have holiness in themselves. Frankincense isn't holy in itself. Amen. Myrrh is not holy in itself. These are spices anybody can pick up and use in something else. I mean, they can use it in whatever they use it. They can spice up a chicken. I don't know what they would use it for. It's not holy and sacred in itself. It's holy and sacred in its purpose. So, so when I say the Holy Ghost, it's holy and sacred in itself. When I say the holy incense, the incense is not holy and sacred in itself. It's holy and sacred in its purpose. Amen. Do we understand? So he's saying, you make this and you use it there. Don't make anything like this for any other purpose. This is holy of the Lord. When God called Israel out, he wanted Israel for his purpose, to serve his purpose, and they were holiness unto the Lord. Not holy in themselves, but holiness unto the Lord. Praise God. Let's go to Exodus 28. I hope this is making the picture clearer, bit by bit. Like I said, I do not want to make a simple subject complicated. I want to keep it simple. So, 
uh, Exodus 28, verse 1. And take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, and he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. So here he's making him holy garments. Is the linen holy? Is the linen sacred? No, it's made sacred because of its purpose. It's now holy garments because these garments are only to be used on the right priesthood in the right service of the temple. That makes them holy garments. See, there, so far we're talking about holiness and we haven't even started talking about conduct yet. We're talking about positioning and purpose and calling and selection and being set apart. Amen. Let's go to verse 35. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in and unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out that he die not. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it, like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So when Aaron would go into the holy of holies, he had a holy garment to put on. He had, he had holy anointing oil. Amen. He, he was... When, when Aaron was being dressed to go into the Holy of Holies, he was being sanctified. Before he's out with the family, he's at home, he's doing whatever he's doing, but in order to go into the Holy of Holies, he had to be sanctified. So the act of sanctifying him was separating him from his brothers, separating from the people, and preparing him for his purpose. That was what they were doing to sanctify him. So they put on him the linen, amen? They, they put on him the, uh, uh, the anointing oil. He had to have the holy garments. He had to have the holy miter and a golden plate on the miter that said holiness unto to the Lord, he had to be separated from his brethren in dress, in anointing, in calling, in purpose, and he was holy unto God, and he would go into the holy place, amen, with a, with a gold plate on his head that said, holiness unto the Lord, amen. He wasn't holy within himself, he was made holy for his purpose. He was sanctified to do what God wanted him to do, and he was sanctified, prepared, set apart, amen, and moved into his purpose, and it was holiness unto the Lord, for the whole nation was holiness unto the Lord. The whole act, the whole temple, the whole worship, everything was pointing to one thing. We are separated, we are dedicated, we are consecrated to you. And that was holiness unto the Lord. Let's go to verse 40. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets, thou shalt make for them glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put upon, upon them Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Amen. These were not better people than other people. They were sanctified and consecrated and made holy for a purpose. I hope you can see yourself. I hope you can begin to see that if, if Aaron would leave this priest office and Aaron would take off his garments and he would go home for the night and if Aaron's wife said something to him and he got sharp with her and said something that made her cry and hurt his feelings... Now was he no longer qualified to be a high priest because he's supposed to be holy. It wasn't just his conduct that made him holy. It was his separation. It was his purpose. It was his placing. It was God calling him. It was, it, that's what made him holy. If he stayed in that purpose and he stayed in his conquered consecration and he kept coming under the purification and the anointing and the right garments in the right place in his position and he kept doing what God called him to do, amen, and he kept offering sacrifices for his failures, 
he would remain holy unto the Lord. He was not He was not trying to obtain holiness. He was staying in holiness because holiness was his separation unto his office, his position, and he had to maintain that by sanctifying himself. If he failed, he had to give a transgress offering. But he didn't, amen, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't no longer become unholy, amen, he was holy because God chose him. Let's go to to Exodus 19. Exodus 19 and verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. So God tells Moses, I'm going to come down and address his people. You sanctify the people. Tell them to wash their clothes, be separated, be prepared for the third day. They were sanctifying themselves in preparation to meet God. And what were they doing? They were just obeying what they were told to do. Amen? So that's how they sanctify themselves, to separate themselves and prepare themselves to meet with God. Now, look at, look at uh, verse 23. And Moses said unto the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. So here we have the same word, sanctify the people, tell them to wash their clothes, separate themselves, and be set apart and be ready for the third day. And now he tells them to sanctify the mountain. Did they wash the mountain? Did they put anointing oil on it? How did they sanctify this mountain? They put a barrier around it and wouldn't let anybody go up there, and it was reserved and set apart and separated for God. It was sanctified. Then the people, when they were sanctified, they were given instructions in their sanctification to wash their clothes, to set themselves apart, and prepare themselves for the third day. They were obeying the word, setting themselves apart to meet God, and the mountain was sanctified, set apart. That, this sanctification doesn't mean they washed it, they scrubbed the bushes, they, they, they sectioned it off so nobody could get on there and it was separated for God. The people were prepared by sanctifying themselves to meet God. And you can see this is both sanctification. Both of this is sanctifying something. So we realize that, that the real purpose to sanctify is to get something consecrated and separated for God's use. Amen. And when it comes into that place where it's set apart for God, it's now holy. Amen. Let's go to Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is a day, not a person, not God. This is a day, but you're to keep it holy. How do you keep a day? How do you make a day holy? You set it apart and you leave it for God's purpose. Amen. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt, do, thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle, nor the stranger is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. So this word, uh, when it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy and hallowed are the same word, and these are the exact same Hebrew word that is translated sanctify for the people who are washing their clothes and sanctify to sanctify the mountain and holy for the day and hallowed for the day. It's all the same thing. What is it? It is set apart and dedicated for a purpose. Set apart and dedicated for a purpose. Amen. Praise God. 
So Brother Bram says, now, what shall we do with, in the message, what shall we do with this Jesus called Christ? He said, a Nazarite is one, one that separates themselves for the word of God. Not short-wearing, painted-faced Jezebels calling themselves Christians. No, sir. Man so wishy-washy that'll stand for a denomination and hold on to their coattails of some Caesar or Herod instead of standing for the word of God. But God has got loyal people, genuine flock of God, who don't care what the world says. They believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 6, and I want to read about the Nazarite vow and see what the Lord said. Brother Branham said, a Nazarite is one who separates themselves for the word of God. And you'll find that Brother Branham is going to pull this term Nazarite and pull it out of the Old Testament and even change the requirements for a Nazarite in the Old Testament and bring it into the believer today. And so let's, let's understand what this is in Numbers chapter 6, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to a vow, a vow of a Nazarite. So what's this? It's a separation. To separate themselves unto the Lord. So they have separated themselves unto the Lord. Let's keep reading. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. And all the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die because the, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. So this Nazarite, he is going to be, he's taking a vow of separation. He's separating from everything, and he is dedicating and consecrating himself unto God for a period of time. Amen. And when he does that, he is called holy unto the Lord. Why is he holy unto the Lord? Well, pfft, it's obvious, Brother Chad. He didn't cut his hair, and he didn't drink wine. And it, it's not his actions. It's not the deeds that make him holy. It's the fact that he consecrated and separated himself to the Lord that made him holy unto the Lord. Amen. It, it wasn't that he drank wine or didn't drink wine because when Jesus came, he drank wine, but he was, he was holy unto the Lord. Right? It wasn't that he cut his hair or didn't cut his hair. Those were all part of the Nazarite vow. When he wanted to separate himself, amen, he would go through a process of consecrating himself or sanctifying himself where he would do the things that God said do to enter into this period where he is dedicated wholly to the Lord. And God would say, he is holy to the Lord. He is holy to me because he is set apart for me for this period of time only, not for work, not for family. Family, not for anything else. He is dedicated to me. And that made him holy. I hope we're understanding holiness a little better. Holiness is not long hair, long skirt, keeping conduct rules. That's not holiness. That can be part of it. But holiness is a separation to God. A dedication to God. Brother Branham said, and God's word calls for a total separation from unbelief. He said, no matter what the price the world has to say about it out there, or how many scornful or laughters or critics that doesn't bother a person that's totally separated from the things of the world to the things of God. They obey the word and separate themselves from the things of the world because the word separates them. This is so important to know that we can't just say, I'm going to take a Nazarite vow and I'm not going to work and I'm not going to uh, uh, go home to my family, but I'm going to the woods and I'm going to pray. I mean, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. He says, here's what Brother Benham says in the same message a little further down. 
He says, but when a man is born in the world for a believer, he becomes a Nazarite when he separates himself from anything that's contrary to the word. What, what is it to be a Nazarite in this day? It is not to let your locks grow long. It is not to, to not eat this and not drink that and not touch a dead body. That's not what it means in this day. In this day, to be a Nazarite means that you, you stay far away from anything that's contrary to the word. You don't touch it. You don't partake of it. Amen. But you consecrate and dedicate yourself for the word. That's what it means to be a Nazarite. And if you're a Nazarite, you're holy unto the Lord. Here's what he says, a Nazarite is holy unto the Lord. Amen. And what separates us? Not our thinking, not our ideas, not our own standard, not our own traditions. That's not what separates us. What separates us is the word. So Brother Bram says, the word is what separates us. Because automatically when the word comes forth, amen, when the word comes forth, then we make a choice on the word. If we choose the word, then there's something we didn't choose. If we say yes to this, there's something else we say no to. It's like a woman when she's being courted, amen? She may have, in a, a, a young sister, she may have had a couple different brothers that were interested in her and friends of her and talking to her, amen? And, but if, if one of them comes up and says, will you marry me? What he's saying is, will you sanctify and consecrate yourself to be holy unto me? That's what he's asking her. Because when they take the vow, they says, will you, will you separate from all else, holding only unto thee? He's asking her, would you sanctify and consecrate yourself and be holy unto me? And if she says yes, then she automatically separated herself and said no to the other suitors. It, it wasn't. This, this, this separation and being holy to God is not our concept or our idea or, or a, a set of things that we think that would be better. No, it is saying yes to the word. When we say yes to the word, we say no to the world and the things that are of the world. And when the word show, when God shows us through the word, through the ministry of a prophet, through the scriptures, what his desire is, and we say yes to that, we've said no to that. And then we begin to consecrate and sanctify ourselves to that word, to do what? To obey it, amen? Because when you recognize that God said, amen, for a woman to wear clothes that's abomination, or that, that pertains to a man, it's an abomination to God, then you says, I say yes to that. When you said yes to that, you said no to all kinds of other fashions. And then when you sanctified yourself to that word, you had to actually go in your closet and take the garments down, put them in a sack and throw them away or take them to Goodwill or whatever you did with them. And what were you doing? You were sanctifying yourself. Not because you thought, well, I think it's more pleasing to God to wear blue than khaki. No. You chose the word. When you saw the word, you said yes to the word. When you said yes to the word, you separated from something to unite with something. And when you did, you sanctified yourself unto that purpose. And when you sanctified yourself into that purpose for the word, you were becoming holy unto the Lord because you were separating from the world and coming to his word. And he is the word. It wasn't, it wasn't the garment that made you holy, amen, it was the consecration and dedication to God that made you holy. Are we starting to see the dividing line? Because a lot of people, Brother Benham said, you can have long hair and a skirt and all these other things, and he said, enough temper to fight a buzzsaw. There's still something wrong. That's not holiness. Right? We can, we can, have, uh, uh, we can have conduct, order, and doctrine, let's just say. And still not have holiness because what we've done is not just take the word and separate to unite with the person of the word. What we're doing is we're keeping a standard of a church to conform to a church or for whatever motivation we have for doing that. But that doesn't equal holiness. You say, why do you dress that way? Because I'm part of a holiness church. You understand how foolish that statement is. The only way that you can be part of holiness is to be wholly dedicated to God. The only way you can be holy is to be wholly surrendered to God. That's the only way to be holy. 
not to wear a certain type of garment, uh, not to, the, the, to speak in a certain way and fellowship with certain kinds of people. You can do all of those things and not be holy, so they cannot be equal to holiness. But what can be equal to holiness? A surrender to the word of God can be equal to holiness. Would it change the way you dress? Without a shadow of a doubt. Will you consecrate yourself to that word? Without a shadow of a doubt. Will you separate from the things of the world? Without a shadow of a doubt. Amen. Because you chose the word, that make, and you've separated from everything to the word, you are holy unto the Lord. Amen. That will change everything because, because it changes everything. When God, when God called out Aaron to be the high priest, amen, God uh, gave him special garments, God gave him special anoint, anointing, God gave him uh, a special miter, he gave him all of these things, and, that, and, and God calling him made him holy, and all of these garments were holy, and everything was holy. But what if somebody from the tribe of Gad would come on and put on holy garments and put on a holy perfume and take a holy miter and take the holy incense? Would it make them holy unto the Lord? Absolutely not, amen? They can't be holy unto the Lord by copying somebody else that's holy unto the Lord. Nobody else in Israel could take Aaron's place and be holy unto the Lord. They would become an abomination because they weren't called to that position. So you cannot be holy by copying somebody else's holiness. What is the only thing that can make us holy? Is to surrender completely to the word. To take the position he's called us into. Listen, we cannot make ourselves holy unto the Lord by any action, by any conduct, by any idea, by any acknowledgement out of our mouth. Because first, in order to be holy unto the Lord, you have to be chosen by the Lord. And if you're not chosen by the Lord, you'll never be holy unto the Lord. Israel had to be chosen before they could be holy. Their choosing is what made them holy. When they consecrated themselves and gave themselves over, they were holy unto the Lord. Uh, Levi had to be chosen. Aaron had to be chosen. First, they have to be chosen. And for you to be holy unto the Lord, first you must be chosen. You must be part of the elect, predestinated bride of Jesus Christ. You must be chosen. And when you're chosen, you must surrender to that position because Aaron had to surrender. Moses had to surrender. Israel had to surrender. See, when we look at this, with this subject, it's so perfect because it is not like you'd look at the subject of holiness and say, that's all, that's all up to me. It's up to me. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. You can't do nothing unless God called you. Amen. All your efforts will be wasted. But neither can you say, well, it's up to God. I'll sit here. If he wants to be holy, he'll make me holy. It's not that way either. So what is holiness? When God choosing me gives me a revelation of what God wants and I surrender to God, that equals holiness. There are things I have to give up, things I have to choose, things I have to lay down. I must sanctify myself. I must dedicate myself. I must consecrate myself. But I'll tell you what, all the giving up and all the consecrating will equal nothing unless he first has called me and consecrated me and dedicated me to himself. There's two parts to this equation. We can't have it all over here or all over here. It's right here in the middle. God calls, God designates, God has a position and placing for each one of us. When we step into that and surrender to that and give our whole lives to the word of God, we can now become holiness unto the Lord. Praise God Almighty. Brother Bam says in the, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. He says, he proves his resurrection life then as he vindicates himself, she, the bride, is independent from all others. She's an independent woman, a great speckled bird that's different from all others. You remember the Bible on that, the great speckled bird, but she had his name. She had his life. How did they speckle the bird? They were both white. Then they pulled the head off of one bird and drained the blood out on the other bird, and the other bird speckled with the red blood, and it flopped its wings like this, and the blood cried, holy, 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 as it bathed the ground. 
So Christ the dead mate put his blood, his blood from his life, into a sprinkle, carrying his blood, crying, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. It's an odd-looking bird. Sure it is, but she, the bride, is identified by him. That's so important. She's identified not by herself. She's identified by him. She's identified by him, and she is independent from all others. Keep thee only unto her as long as you both live. Keep thee only unto him the word. No adultery, not one sign of denomination, not one sign of creed, no adultery at all. The word and him alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand, said Airy Perinet. That's it. Christ the word. He was the word. He is the word. And the church becomes the word by him making her a part of him. And that's the word again personally identified by him, his property alone, his property alone. I say if she is his property alone, she is holy unto the Lord. If that's his property alone, she is holy unto the Lord. She is redeemed by him, through him, for him, and for him alone. That's right. Then what the devil is howling about? That it's being revealed. What is, the, what is the problem is that she's coming to this realization of what true holiness is, amen? She's redeemed by him, for him, to him, and him alone. What's that mean? Is she is sanctified, consecrated, dedicated to him. She is given holy to him. She is now holy unto him, making her a holy bride. Not holy because of her conduct, not holy because of her action, holy because he chose her for himself and she surrendered to him. Now she is a holy bride. And do you think that holy bride who has been selected, called by him, by him, for him, to him, and him alone, she can't be anything else but a holy bride. And then if she has heard the call and heard the word and separated from every other idea, separated from every other concept, separated from every other tradition, separated from everything and united to her headship to Christ, then she is a holy bride. Do you think if she goes out tomorrow and makes a mistake and fails that she is no longer a holy bride? Do you think she's no longer chosen by God? You think she's no longer predestinated or elected? No, but she must sanctify herself and keep herself sanctified. She must come back through repentance and stay connected to Christ. She's not holy by title only, right? Jesus, I mean, God, he designated the people Israel. They were his holy people. They were holiness unto the Lord. He wanted to, to, to use them to demonstrate himself. But when they backslid and left him, he allowed them to get taken into bondage and taken far away. Amen. It, it, it looked terrible, but God never forgot his people. And he brought them back. God will never forget his chosen elect bride. Do we make mistakes? Absolutely we make mistakes. But how have we lost our position? Only if we're not elect. We have to sanctify ourselves. But in sanctifying ourselves will never make us a holy bride if he didn't call us to be a holy bride. Let's turn to the New Testament. I want to look at a few scriptures in the New Testament. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter two. And we're going to read verse 13. Second Thessalonians 2 and 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 
For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in... I'm sorry. I did it again. I'm in 1 Thessalonians. I would love it if something supernatural would happen now. And I could look back and say, that was because of this. Not just because I can't read. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God has chosen you unto salvation through sanctification of spirit and belief of the truth. And this word sanctification means consecration or purification. It's used in the Bible to mean sanctification and holiness. Brother Branham picked up this term, this word here, and here's how he described it. He says, in the future home, he says, now let me take this board just a minute. He's drawing something on the blackboard. Here's a human heart. I'm a long ways from being an artist. Here's a human heart, and here's a human heart. He's got two human hearts. Now, this one over here has a snake in it. That's sin. Here he has his life. This one over here has a dove in it, which is the Holy Spirit. Here he has, here he has life. Well, this one here, he has malice, hatred, envy. That's what's causing it is this fellow here. Well, this one over here has love and joy and long suffering. That's what does it down here. Now, when you're asked or you are forgiven of your sins, you're only done this, taken that away, taken the sin, the hatred, malice, and all that away. But the thing that made you do it is still there. That's the old root of evil, it's still there. Notice, when you repent and are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he forgave you of your sins, notice, then secondly comes sanctification, which sets our mind in order for holiness to think right. Sanctification is a compound Greek word which means cleaned, and set aside for service. Brother Bram goes through this, and, and he goes through this in the new birth, that first we're justified, amen, then we're sanctified, cleansed, and set aside for service. Then he goes on, he says, the next comes the baptism of the fire of the Holy Ghost, and God might dwell in us, and the fire of God cleanses our hearts from sin and puts the Holy Ghost inside. Then we bring forth the same life that this did, because that's in us. So he begins to tell us that we have justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and sanctification is cleansed, amen, by the Spirit of God and belief of the truth, cleansed and set aside for service. And then in the filling of the Holy Ghost, we're put into service. Uh, there's a reason I'm getting into this. I want to read this next quote in Birth Pains. Since so it is in the spiritual realm, it's water, justification by faith, believing on God, receiving him as your personal savior, and being baptized. Second is sanctification of the spirit, that God cleanses the spirit from all elements of the world and the desire of the world. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and gives new birth and fills up that sanctified vessel. For instance, like this, now that I told you, what, what you don't believe, lay aside and take, he's talking about eating that cherry pie, spitting out the seed, take the pie. Now, a glass is laying out in the chicken yard. You don't just pick that up and put it on your table and fill it up with water or milk. No. By picking it up, it's justification. Cleansing it is sanctification because the Greek word sanctify is a compound word means clean, cleanse and set aside for service, not in service, for service. Then when you fill it, it's put in service. So he starts telling the analogy of a, a glass that's in a hog pen and a manure pile, and you pick it up, that's justification. That's God choosing it, amen? That's God, God's beginning the process of setting it apart, amen? If God didn't choose you, you're not chosen, amen? You can't choose yourself. No man can come to me lest the Father draws him, amen? It's got to be God doing the drawing for us to even come to him. So when he picks you up, what's he doing? He's beginning the whole process of setting you apart. He's separating you from the world. He's pulling you to himself, amen? He's beginning the whole process. Then what he does, by the washing of the water of the word, he begins to wash and purge and clean that glass so that he can use it for a purpose, then when it's all cleaned, amen, and ready, he'll fill that glass, amen. When you take a natural glass, you'll fill it and you'll set it on the table and use it for a drinking glass. You'll use it for a purpose. That's what God is doing with each one of us, amen. He is drawing us to himself. He's choosing us, selecting us, setting us apart from the world, 
First, he grabs a hold of us by drawing us to himself. He claims us for his own. You're mine. We're redeemed. Then he begins to clean us and sanctify us. Amen. And what's he doing? He's dedicating us, preparing us by the word for a service, and then he's putting us into service. What is that whole process? Holiness unto the Lord being set aside and used for his purpose. The same thing he did with the high priest, the same thing he did with Israel, the same, he, he, is, he is redeeming, cleansing, sanctifying, and putting into service. That is holiness unto the Lord. Now, let's look at 1 Peter. First Peter chapter two. I just want to go just a, just a little bit further, just a few more scriptures. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The first part of this, verse 9, he's using language that is almost identical to the way God spoke about Israel. When God selected Israel out of all nations and he chose them for his own purpose and he sanctified them unto himself by pulling them out of Egypt and redeeming them, amen, and, 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 he, and, and he intended to clean them up all the way and put them in the service to take back the land, amen. And so God, God had a purpose and a plan for that. But now he says, you who were not a people, you're not Israel, you were not a people, amen, are now become a people, But he said, you're a chosen generation, verse 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He's talking to dispersed Gentiles, amen? Gentiles that were heathens, Gentiles that were pagans, Gentiles that that knew not God, amen? And they've come to the the, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They've come to the gospel message. And he says, you're a holy nation, Amen. And it's amazing that he called them a holy nation because there was still so much growing they needed to do. Peter began to talk, or Paul began to talk to them and admonish them in Corinthians and talk to them about their immaturity and the wrong use of gifts and and, and sin that they led in the church. There was so much that was still wrong with this, this, this people, this fledgling Christian church. But Peter looks at them and says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Amen. And that's the same thing God did to Israel. You are my chosen. You are my redeemed. I redeemed you. You are my firstborn. Amen. Then he calls Levi. Levi, you are holy unto me. He calls Aaron, you are holy unto me. Amen. There was a whole lot of work that needed to be done to them. A whole lot of cleaning up that still needed to take place in their lives. Amen. A whole lot of sanctification, separation, and dedication. There was a lot of things they needed to learn about God and line up to, but it didn't change the fact that he called them to be a holy nation. And in this early fledgling church, there was a whole lot Paul had to set straight in the Gospels. There was a lot of correction that needed to take place, a lot lot of wrong understanding and a misuse of things, but they were still a chosen generation. They were still a royal priesthood. As much as Levite was a priesthood, would always be a priesthood because of God's designation, this too is a royal priesthood. A holy nation. That's why this bride is a holy bride. And you can look at that and you can look in the mirror and you can say, I'm no holy bride. I did this and I've done that. You're looking at the wrong place. You need to look in this mirror. You need to look to what God has called to himself, that God has designated to himself, that God has chosen for himself. Hey, listen, Levite was not a tribe that had a tremendous blessing on them. Even Isaac at his death, when he, when he spoke the blessing over his children, Levite, he reminded Levite that he was cruel in the way that he dealt with a nation, amen, when, he, when, when they tricked him, when he and his brother tricked them into circumcision, then went in and killed them all, lied to them, deceived them, and killed them all. And Israel said, you make me stink amongst the other people. 
Levite wasn't chosen because he was the nicest boy and the nicest tribe. He was chosen because he was God's choice. And God didn't choose you to be in the bride because you were the nicest person. How many, how many of us wish we were nicer? I mean, you see another brother, and he's so friendly. He's got that gregarious personality, and everybody loves to be around him. When he walks in the room, people stand, oh, brother, and they hug you. And you walk in the room, they're like, hi. Some people have magnetic personality. Some people don't. Some people are so smooth and easy. Some people are a little rough. And you look at this when you compare, and we err comparing ourselves among ourselves, and we think, that brother's made it, but I haven't. And, you know, and we start to judge based off what we see and not judge based off what God has chose. You are a holy people. You say, but you don't know what I did yet yesterday. If God has chose you, if you're elected bride, if you're the seat gene of God called for this day, you're a holy people. What is it we need to do? We need to surrender. We need to consecrate ourselves to that word. God has done his part by calling us. He's done his part by identifying us in the word. Now we must do our part by choosing no to everything that's not the word and saying yes to everything that is the word and consecrating ourselves to this word to come into what he's already told us we are. It's not, this holiness is not something we attain to through sinless perfection. This holiness is something he's called us to by positional placement. Let's go to Ephesians chapter five. Very familiar to all of us, but so necessary in this teaching. Ephesians chapter five, verse 25. Ephesians 5 and 25, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God wants a spotless, wrinkle-free bride. Is that what he wants? So God will present to himself a bride without spot or wrinkle. He's not asking the bride to present herself without spot or wrinkle. Read this correctly. Because if we read this wrong, we go back to Nazarene understanding. We go back to Pentecostal holiness understanding. He didn't ask the bride to present herself spotless and wrinkle free. He said he will present himself a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. How's he going to do it? He's going to wash her. How's he going to wash her? With the washing of the water by the word. God has sent the washing in this day. God has sent the purifying in this day. He has sent the waters of separation that separate us from the world and to himself. Amen. In the the Old Testament, they had a water of separation, and it was made with the ashes of a red heifer. They were told to take a red heifer without spot, without blemish and perfection, go outside the camp, burn the red heifer, take the ashes, mix it with water, and every vessel in the tabernacle was sanctified, was cleansed by the ashes of the red heifer. The water was sprinkled on it, and it was determined clean. The water Without the water of sprinkling, it was not yet ready for service, although it was ordained for service. It was ordained. It was made according to what God said. It was, it was separated unto its service, but it must be sanctified. How was it washed? By the ashes of a red heifer, the waters of separation that separated it to God's purpose. So how was God Cleansing his temple through the waters of separation, through the word. God sent a word in this day, a pure word, a clean word, a perfect word. And that word is the word that is washing his bride. So that he can present to himself a bride 
without spot or wrinkle. He's not asking us to jump through hoops. He's not setting the bar higher and higher and higher. What he's done is he's called us to himself. He's told us we're a holy nation. He told us we're a peculiar people, that we're his holy bride. And then he is bringing a washing, a water that will make us everything he said we are if we will surrender to the word. Remember, there's the two parts again. There's the part God does, and there's the part we do. Brother Bram says in Broken Sisters, to me, he is the waters of the word of separation that separates you from everything that's contrary to his word. That's the fountain I believe him to be. Yes, sir. That's the waters that separated me from the man-made cisterns, the fountain of living water. And, And the seed shall possess the gate of his enemy, he says, And the Holy Spirit is our circumcision. It's God's sharp knife. It separates and cuts off the surplus of the flesh of the world from us. The word of God, sharper than a two-edged sword. So you see, come right back again. The word of God is the thing that the Holy Spirit uses, not creeds, not denominations, but the word is what separates us from the things of the world. It cuts away our ideas and things and wholly consecrates us to God. If the word cuts away the world and we stay surrendered to the word, it cuts away the world and keeps us wholly consecrated to God. What's the word doing? The word is sanctifying us. The word is cleansing us. The word is purging us. The word is purifying us. The word is sanctifying us to bring us into that position of holiness. It's gone. In the message, hear ye him, he says, this is the washing of the water of separation by the word. The word, what washes us and cleanses us? He says, sanctify them, Father, through the truth. He said, thy word is truth. Is that right? And we're washed of the waters of the separation from our sins by the word of God. The word separates us and sets us in place. Now listen, we have to, we, we, we want to recognize what he's talking about. He's not talking about playing a tape, and so I play the tape, and now I'm washed. That makes sense. I read my Bible, I read the church age book, now I'm clean. It's not the hearing, it's the surrender to. It's the obedience, it's the surrender. He brings the word, you can't bring the word, you can't wash yourself, he has to do the washing, but you must surrender to the word, that's your choice. Praise God. I want to read uh, Matthew chapter 15 together. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Oh, my. Yeah. Matthew 15 and 1. It says, then, he came to, then came Jesus, came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So here come the Pharisees, the good old Pharisees. And they were trying to be strict and keep all the ordinances and the traditions of the fathers to be acceptable unto God. But the thing is, well, they were completely unaccepted by God because they didn't accept God. They accept traditions and rules and they had all kinds of washing pots and washing this and rituals and ceremony. They had all kinds of things that looked great with tons of effort that made it look clean and made it look holy, but they were not accepted by God because they didn't accept God, right? They were trying to do something, right? So then they start to criticize the disciples. Why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? Why don't they keep the tradition of the fathers? And Jesus gives them a wonderful answer in verse 17. He says, do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. All of a sudden, Jesus taught him a very valuable lesson. You're worried about a man defiling himself by eating with unwashed hands. 
It's not the eating with what, not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of his heart that defiles him. It's the condition of the heart being expressed is what's defiling the man, not what he's putting in, but what's coming out. Amen. So God, Christ is showing them that what you need is a change in your heart. Amen. Not all of these ordinances to try to keep everything outside from coming inside. You need the thing that really defiles a man is the wickedness inside coming outside. That's what defiles him. Amen. This is the fallacy of the holiness movement. This is the fallacy of any legalistic movement. The Pharisee movement, the holiness movement, the, the fallacy is that we can, we can, through conduct and order, keep any evil from coming in and defiling ourselves. We dress right, talk right, go to church, do all these things, and, and, and we don't watch anything, and we don't, we don't listen to any bad thing, we don't do any bad thing, we won't let any bad thing come in. The problem is the thing that's defiling you is unregenerate hearts. The thing that's defiling you is not being born again. The thing that is corrupting you is that which is coming out of you. Amen. You need the word to come in and be a sanctifying process and the Holy Ghost to come in and burn out all of that and bring you into the position the word has for you. Amen. Amen. That's why putting on will never work. That's why uh, doing will never work. Amen. It's got to be his doing, our surrender to his doing that will come in and bring a change on the inside because the corruption that is in man is in the heart of man. That's why rule keeping won't do it. But I tell you one thing, if the holy fire of God has burnt out the old nature and burnt out the old men and the seed of God has sprung to life, amen, and you become holiness unto the Lord, it'll change the way you dress. It'll change the way you talk. It'll change your attitudes. And that which starts coming out of you will not be what defiles you, but what comes out of you will be the very life of God will be coming out of your mouth. Amen. And your kindness and your sweetness and your temperament change and all of these things that are taking place is because we've come surrendered to the word. And it washed us and he purified us and he burned us and he changed us. And then when we become holiness unto the Lord, we will dress holy, talk holy, walk holy, think holy, feel holy. You understand? That's the holiness we need. Look at one more aspect as we depart as we finish in John chapter 17. This is the last thing I want to point out. John 17. Jesus says, John 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So what brings sanctification in our lives? The truth. Amen. What is this message? The truth. Amen. What did God bring us? The truth. Amen. And what will that truth do to us? It'll sanctify us. Amen. But it won't sanctify us if we push play and don't obey. Amen. It won't sanctify us if we just come to church and go home and no surrender. It won't sanctify the, the washing of the water of the word doesn't wash just because these ears heard the word. It'll wash when these ears hear the word and you say, that ain't nothing but the truth and I'm going to give my life to it. Amen. It takes both parts. So he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself. This is such an interesting scripture. For their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus is saying, for their sakes, I sanctify myself. And the question is, did Jesus need cleansed? Did he need purified? Did he need perfected? What, what is Jesus saying? For their sakes, I sanctify myself. He's, he is the holy child. He is the holy one of Israel. He is the holy God. He is the Messiah. What does he need to sanctify himself for? He's the holy one. Does anybody believe he's the holy one of Israel? Then you would think he's already sanctified. 
But what he's showing, he's saying, I am consecrating myself for their sakes. And here's what Brother Branham said about it in adoption. He said, that's one of the sweetest words that I ever heard. Father, I sanctify myself for their sakes. Do you know he had a right to have a home? He was a human. He would have a right to a wife. He was a man. He had a right to all of these things. He, but he said, Father, I sanctify myself for their sakes. I sanctify myself. I was talking to a little preacher yesterday, going to preach for him in a few nights up here on the highway, and I asked him about a certain thing. He said, yes, Brother Branham, but most of my people doesn't believe in that. I said, I said most of all of them are legalists. He said, yes. Brother doesn't, the brother doesn't believe that, but he said, for their sake, I, I, oh, I wanted to hug his neck, for their sake. I sanctify myself for their sake. Here he's talking about a brother, a minister. And and Brother Branham, I don't know what the conversation was or what the challenge was, but Brother Branham says, uh, he must have questioned why he did something. And Brother Branham said, he says, Brother Branham, most of my people don't believe that. And Brother Branham said, they're mostly legalist. And the man said, yes. So there's, there's a man with a congregation. That congregation is struggling to believe something a certain way. The man doesn't believe it that way, but he's consecrated himself for their sakes. He's sanctified himself. He's dedicated himself to something for their sakes, not even something he needs to do, not even something he has to do, but he did it for their sakes. He's got the right. He knows the word. He can go and do whatever he wants. He's got the liberty. He's got the freedom. Amen. He can go do it, but he knows that it would challenge the people in the crowd. They wouldn't understand it because of what they believe. So he sanctifies himself for their sakes. And Brother Bam said, oh, I wanted to hug his neck. Said, sanctifying myself for their sake. Old Jesus was training 12 men that through these 12 men was to take the gospel to the world. And he said, for their sake, I sanctify myself. Make, make yourself for your neighbor's sake, for somebody else's sake. Don't use your liberty for a cloak, said Paul, but sanctify yourself. Behave yourself in the neighborhood like a real Christian ought to. Let your communication, if you meet your enemy, sanctify yourself for his sake, not knowing what you might do. He goes on in fellowship, he says, I think the sweetest scripture there is in all the Bible is this scripture, Father, I sanctify myself because of them. He was a man, he could have had a wife. He was a man, he could have had a home, a place to lay his head. He had a right to that, he was a man. He could have had good clothes, he was a man. But what did he say? Father, I sanctify myself for their sake. What was he doing? He was training up 12 disciples that were going to preach the gospel in all the world. He put on an example. And brethren, as ministers, I tell you, it pays us not to get too much of the world's goods and things hanging around us. You preachers I'm talking to, sanctify yourselves for them that you're going to lead. That's what we need today is a complete, consecrated, sanctified life of ministers that walk upright before God, does not entangle with the things of the world, keep away from it. Father, I sanctify myself for their sake, for not because he had to do it, but he did it for their sake. Can we do that for each other? We can do that for the neighbor. Can we do that for the enemy? Can we do that for whoever? He, it wasn't that he was trying to obtain something. It's not always that we have to get something from God or a reward from God. Sometimes we just keep ourselves in a certain place for the benefit of somebody else. Keep ourselves consecrated to God in a certain thing for somebody else's benefit, for somebody else's welfare. That's what Jesus did. He didn't need to be purified, he was the Holy One. But he needed to keep himself consecrated and dedicated in a certain way for the ones that were around him. Did he have liberty? Yes. Are we a free people? We're a free people. Will God cast us away, amen, with every mistake? No, he won't cast us away. We have liberty, we have liberty, but let's not use liberty as a cloak for maliciousness or selfishness. But let's keep ourselves dedicated to the word. Keep ourselves dedicated to the Lord and to one another for each other's sake. I'm going to read one more scripture, Hebrews chapter 2. Musicians, you can go ahead and start making your way up. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it became him 
for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. The one who's doing the sanctifying and the one who's being sanctified are all of one. Whatever he is, I am. He's the bridegroom, I'm the bride. He's the word, I'm the word. The thing that's sanctifying and me who's being sanctified are all one. He has called us to our position in this day to be the bride. And he's called us to be a holy bride. A bride that's set apart unto him. What does it mean to be holy? To be consecrated and set apart for the word. To be dedicated and separated to the word. That's what it means to be holy. Let's all stand. Holiness is not necessarily to make ourselves perfect or pure through actions, deeds, or restraints. But to be holy unto the Lord means that we're chosen by God, that he has called us, and that we have surrendered to that and subjected ourselves to his word. To be holy is to be wholly consecrated to the Lord. Amen. Can I do that and make a mistake? You can do that and make a mistake. Can you be holy and still not have everything in your right set, aside, set, set right because you're still learning? Yes, you can be holy and still learning. Like Israel was, like the first church was, you can be holy and still growing in your knowledge of the Lord and still be holy. Holy is not something you're going to come to someday. Holy is a position God's put you in and you're surrendered to that position. And I say, God... Help me to be consecrated to this word and to be holy unto the Lord. Amen. God bless you. I love you all. Man, we're going to ask Brother Alan and Sister Tammy if you'd like to make your way around back and get prepared for the baptism. You can do that at this time. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I pray, God, that you would help us all to understand Lord, the thing that I was trying to preach, Lord, I, I pray you fill all gaps, Lord, and you correct any wrongs. I pray you would plant in the heart of your children the correct understanding. God, that we wouldn't take old denominational ideas, but we would look at your word. What your prophet has brought in this day, what you've made us to be. God, may we understand what it is you want from our lives, what it is you're looking for in us, and may we give it to you, Lord. God, I believe above all, you're looking for a surrendered heart. You're looking for someone that you have called who will surrender their life and lay down all thoughts and all ideas and come to that word, to submit to it and to obey it. God, I want to be that kind of person. I pray, Lord, that you would wash us by the washing of the water of your word and separate us from all the wrong understanding and wrong desires that have plagued us all these years. And God, through the revelation of your word, that you would purge us from those things, and that we would always have a desire, Lord, to surrender to everything that you show us, and that we can be consecrated and dedicated unto you, and that you who have called us to consecration and dedication will help us, Lord. We want to be holy unto you. God, I pray you bless your people that you would guide us, that you would watch over us, that you would protect us and use us for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, God bless you all. Blake, you have a song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary.
God has always called his people to be holy. God called a holy people to make a holy temple and the holy God would indwell among them. What made them holy was his choice and his presence. When they chose not to go his way anymore, he left, his presence left, and he let them go into bondage and let the temple be destroyed. Because it wasn't holy because of the fabric, it wasn't holy because of the gold, it was holy because of his selection, his choosing, his purpose, and his presence. Brother Bram said it wasn't the holy mountain, it was the holy God on the mountain that made it holy. When Moses came to Jesus at a burning bush, to take off your shoes for the ground you stand on is holy ground. It wasn't the sand, it wasn't the dirt, it was the presence of God, it was the place God chose. And we, by a revelation of the word in this day, we can say we are a holy people. We can say it without shame. You can say it looking in the mirror. You can say it knowing that there's some things in your life you wish were better, there's some things you wanna grow in, but you can still say we are a holy people not by my choice, but by his choice. We're a holy people because he called us to be a holy people and he's given us a word that'll sanctify and cleanse us and his presence is in his bride, making it a holy people. Amen. Once you know that you're a holy vessel, when you know it, when you know that God has called you, that God has washed you and that God is dwelling in you and you know that it's his intention for you and you've surrendered to that. Amen, you may have a whole list of things that you wish were better and you may have a whole idea about how you'd like to change yourself, but it doesn't change the fact you're a holy person. And when you come to that realization, I tell you friends, it changes the way we live. It changes the way we think, it changes the decisions we make. Amen. We need to realize what God has done for us in this day and where he's at, who he is, who we are. And we can claim, we can say, by the grace of God, I am a holy person. God's called me to this position. God's washed me in his word. I, with all that's in my heart, surrender to that. And he has filled me with his spirit. I am a holy person. We are by God's grace, a holy bride. Why does a holy person wanna go act unholy? You don't once you realize you're a holy person. And why does a holy person trying to be holy? You're just a holy person. Not because we climbed the ladder, we outdid the Pharisees, he chose us. It was so simple. He called, I responded, he did the rest. And now because of that, I want to consecrate myself for this purpose. I want to dedicate myself to this purpose. Though I may have some liberties and I may, but I don't want to do anything that paints the wrong picture to anybody else. I now consecrate myself to be a holy person for my neighbor, for my coworker, for my brothers and sisters. That's our desire. Oh, what God has done for us is remarkable. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation now. I just want to say thank you, God. Amen, Blake.
I surrender. tremendous day. Wonderful to be here to observe this, but it's wonderful for Sister Tammy and Brother Allen. I had a chance to sit and talk with them yesterday and hear their story and what God's doing for them, and it's just remarkable. I just thank God how God knows how to reach down and find his seed and grab them and pull them to himself. Amen. He hasn't quit searching. Amen. He hasn't quit finding. He hasn't quit calling. So this is just a remarkable time. They've been fellowshipping here with us for three or four months, and the Lord just let them. They have came, and they've had questions. They've had, uh, uh, they wanted to know where God wanted them, but God supernaturally has used uh, Brother Benjamin Seabolt and others in the assembly to, to, to confirm where he wants them to be, that they're on the right track, and they know that the next step in their journey is baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're going to be obedient to the word of God. And how many of you will pray for this couple? That God will fill them with his spirit according to his promise and lead them every step in his perfect will. Amen. Sister Tammy, because you want to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and you've accepted his call for your life, it's with joy I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, Father, for my sister. I thank you, God, that you've called her, Lord, by your own calling, by your own choosing, by your own way. And you've made it personal and you've made it specific for her. And God, she has obeyed your word in being baptized in your name. And I pray, God, that you would keep your word in her life, for you've promised, Lord, if she would repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that she shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. I pray that you fill her, Lord. Let her light, life be a light to the world and that shines forth from this vessel for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Hold on to the rail. And now we have Brother Allen. God bless you, brother. The testimony is so amazing that Sister Tammy was raised as a child in the message. She knew it, but... When they got married, she left, they were married. Brother Allen has no, really no church raising from the time he's a teenager. He went and, and for years and years and years, they just went on like that. But when God's appointed time came, God knows exactly where we're at, amen. We've never been lost. God never lost track of us. He knew where we were. And so uh, we were talking yesterday, it was just interesting that he's never known the message, never even raised in church. And when God got a hold of him, he just got a hold of him and led him in this path. And I asked Sister Tammy, I said, what, have you ever thought as a growing up, as, you know, have you ever thought back to those years of the message and the truth and not going to church or doing anything? And she says, inside, I always knew I would come back. Amen. How is it that the seed always knows, amen? No matter where life is going, 
And it was going to be her husband that was going to lead her back. Amen. God is so good and so faithful. We can rejoice in what he's done right here. Amen. God bless you, Brother Alan. Because you've also accepted the call of the Lord and you've received him. Because you've obeyed, you want to obey him and be baptized in his name. It's also with joy I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, as I lay hands on my brother Alan, Lord, you have so supernaturally led him to this point. You have guided him. You've called him, Lord. God, and I pray now that you would confirm your promise, Lord, for this promise is to us and to our children, from our fathers to our children, to as many as you should call and you have called. So the promise is for my brother. I pray that you fill him with your spirit, Lord, that you quicken the seed within, and Lord, that he would live the life you've ordained for this time. Bless him, shield him from all the fiery darts of the enemy, and let his light shine in this world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you, brother. Thank you. God bless you all. Blake. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah.